aspect of it. What is hope? Uh, let's look at some definitions to start with. Uh, it's to cherish a desire with anticipation or to want something to happen or be true. Uh, a second definition would be desire accompanied by expectations of or belief in fulfillment. Okay? So the question to you all is, is hope self-generated? Don't everybody answer it <laughs> once. Yeah. Okay, no. Okay, I heard that. No, it's not self-generated. Um, you're not on your own here. Okay, so let's read uh, from uh, Hebrews. Uh, we're going we're gonna to read, I, I originally read this in the New King James, but we're going to be in um, uh, chapter 6, verses 17 through 20. And I, then I looked in the um, NIV, and it was a little bit uh, easier to, so go ahead and open up uh, your, your uh, Bibles to uh, Hebrews 6, verse 17, and we'll start there. And uh, just while you're finding it, I'm going to read a little bit of New King James, and you'll know why I'm going to go to NIV. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirm it, confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope and I won't complete. Do you understand why New King James is interesting to read? So now let's read it, since it's up there, and we'll read it in IV, and they kind of buffer it a little bit and give you a little bit better flow pattern. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it, it is impossible for God to lie, we who, uh, let's see, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us make, may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It in, enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunners, Jesus, have entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Um, um, so basically what it is, is he's given us that hope. He's the one had, that is providing us for the, 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 the strength um, for what we talked about, the desire of, of accompanied by the expectation or uh, a belief in fulfillment. Okay? Hope. All right? So... What do we do? What do we do for for hope? Me, um, or uh, uh, what do you hope for? Uh, me personally, um, I I hoped when uh, certainly when I was younger that um, I would be successful. Uh, what's the definition of success? It it's the realization of goals. So if you set goals, you can be successful in anything that you're doing, um, and so. Uh, that, that was one of mine. And then the second was, after I was born again, was a full re relationship with Christ. That, that was one of the things I hoped for. Okay? Uh, and then the question becomes, uh, why do we have hope? Uh, and the answer in Hebrews was because of the immutable, and I like that word. You can add it to your vocabulary if you haven't already. Unchanging over time, immut immutable. Um, Promises of God to never leave, forsake, abandon, or, or uh, not provide for us. That's where our hope is coming from. So let's wrap our, let's wrap our hearts and our minds around that. Okay? Uh, do you have, uh, do we have that hope because of self or others? We already asked ourselves that question, and then it's uh, apparently not. Be, and, and the reason I say that, look at the number of wealthy, powerful, successful, um, popular people that are depressed and oftentimes commit suicide. So if their hope lies within, it didn't work, did it? Why? Because we've all been taught and that Christ left a big old hole, right? Dead center in the middle of us that can only be filled by him. And that's that hope 
you know, for, the, for what's to come. And, and I, I'm, in my own life, a good picture of some of those promises of Christ. I did not know Christ until, uh, let's see, I was 20, 26 years old. So there was a lot of time for me to get in trouble. And I, did, I, I played uh, rugby in college. And, of course, anybody who knows rugby, uh, anybody uh, rugby player in here? Good, you're smarter than I was. Uh, it, anybody know the old Andy Cap um, comic strip? Andy Cap? Somebody, some, some, some of the, yeah, good. Andy Cap was a rugby player. Where was he in that comic strip? He was already in, always in the bar, wasn't he? Well, unfortunately in rugby, uh, one of the things that's, uh, that happens quite frequently is we have what we call the third half. Rugby is two 45-minute halves, and then the third half is, yep, you guessed it, drinking. And there's, there were numerous cases, um, uh, BB before Becky, uh, that, uh, and, and because after I met Becky, um, she looked at me and she said, don't ever take me to those third half parties again. Um, they are, they're nasty. Uh, but one of the things that happened is that we, we were irresponsible, uh, absolutely no self-responsibility, and we, we oftentimes did things that should have left us as a, a, a goose spot on the road. For example, you are impaired and you start riding a motorcycle and you don't have to worry about hitting anybody else because you're on a motorcycle and uh, you should end up being squashed by somebody else. Well, I didn't know Christ at the time, but he, for, for uh, what unknown reasons, only by his grace, he kept me uh, wheels down, body up. And uh, I pushed those limits all the time. So it was one of those things that in retrospect, I learned about that hope. I learned about the, the things that I was striving for. Um, so the second thing that I want to come back, bring across is um, the fact that um, he teaches us through, his, through trials and tribulations. I, I, one, of the, one of the things that happened through my life is that once I... Once, let me rephrase that. Once Christ found me, he began improving. And how many of you have seen the, the, the potter uh, demonstration? What does he do? He makes a pot. He starts making the pot and he builds it up. And um, then all of a sudden he goes like this. And he squashes it all back down because he didn't like it. And that's kind of your life and you walk with Christ. And that's where I was. Um, I, it, it's a, hope is a perpetual thing. It's, it's one of those things that as, as you move through time, it continues to follow you in, in, with its own momentum. You know? And that's what's happened through the trials and tribulations that you end up going through. Is that they put pressure on you. Uh, they end up uh, causing you to question but when you come out the other side, what ends up happening? Your hope is stronger. Your faith is stronger. So let's uh, read in Hebrews 10, 23, 25. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as it is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So we're, we're to hold fast to the confession of our hope, okay? And that's the, that's the focus, okay? Is, is what is our confession of hope? Not, not what is he teaching us, what, what is somebody else doing, but what is our confession of hope? What's, what's, what's our witness? Nobody else's. But look what he says. He says, unwavering. He, and in other words, whatever you're going through, it should never change. It should not, you know, your, your strength shouldn't be there. But what does he say? Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. So he's giving you a hint there. If you hide out in your house... Your hope's going to shrink along with your faith because you're not, you're forsaking the assembly of fellow believers. 
How many of you go to a, 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 a get-together, we'll use that terminology instead of a party, uh, a get-together where it's um, secular friends, and there's a lot of unusual uh, conversations there, aren't there? If you go to a party of believers, oftentimes it's very directed and you're, you, you become, m- m- there's a lot better interaction of who each other are. You frequently will ask, well, how are you doing? Well, you do that in the secular world and what do you do? You say, how are you doing? And then you walk away. You didn't wait for the answer. So w- one of the things he's telling you is in, in learning how to uh, assemble and be associated with each other, the key factor is stand there and listen. Understand what the individual is going through. It's not about you. It's about what you can do. This is, this is our message, our ministry. It's not about you. It's about what you do for others. Oh, you have needs, and you're, you can sit down with those needs, and you can work them one-on-one in your quiet space with God. And then if you have a need that you just don't see an answer to, then you go to others, and when that individual asks you, and they see your need, then the two of you can get together. But your goal in a assembly is to always go forward with individuals and look at them and say, what are your needs? That's far better than looking inside and going, you know what, this is going on and, and, and I, woe is me and that type of a thing. Oh, not to worry, God will put somebody there that will walk up and say, your countenance has dropped. You're, you're, not as, you're, you're not as engaged. What's wrong? And then you can tell them, not to worry. But if your direction is always that kind of a prayer where it's about me, it's about me, it's about me, it's about me, that's not what God wants from us. We're supposed to listen. We're supposed to understand. We're supposed to look at our fellow believers and work with them and find out what their needs are. So how are things going in your lives? All right? is, is there turmoil? Is there strife? Is there conflict? Right now I have got conflict as this thing pulls down in the back. There we go. Um, the answer is, of course, the most definite yes. Um, Heed his counsel and uh, find fellow believers. Then pray, and it will calm your heart. Uh, We are to um, persevere because we uh, have one another to help out. As the writer in Hebrews 10 says, hold unwaveringly to the hope of of what we profess. In other words, don't don't let it um, be tainted by the things of the world. Uh, let us give a, uh, let's not give up the meeting with, with each other. That was in uh, verses 24 through 25. Um, put this in practice. Give each other um, uh, your contact information. How many of you do that? You ask about somebody, and what do you do? You, you, you say, well, it's a, it was wonderful to meet you. And then you forget them. Well, that's not a good way. Get their contact information, if they'll give it to you. <laughs> you know, that might be a question. Isn't it? But get their contact information and, and say, hey, I'm praying for you. I'm going to send you a text every time that I pray for you, encourage you, that type of a thing. Don't do things superficially. The world's way too much superficial right now. Do things with the bold. That's what, he, that's what uh, the author's trying to tell us here. So now, having uh, dealt with that, Let's go into a little bit of the Old Testament, Ezekiel 22, 6 through 12. And this is New King James. And this is, a, this is about, anytime they we're in the Old Testament, now God's talking specifically through prophets, um, through teachers, etc., about what Israel or his people are doing. And he says, look, the princes of, Is, the princes of Israel... Okay, in other words, all the, the, the little minions of, of Israel. Each one of them, each one has used his power to shed blood in you. In you, 
They have made light of father and mother. In your midst, they have oppressed the stranger. In you, they have mistreated the fatherless and the widow. You have despised my holy things and profaned my Sabbath. In you are men who slander to, to cause bloodshed. In you are those who are eat on the mountain. In your midst, they commit lewdness. In you, men uncover the father's nakedness. In you, they violate women who are set apart during their impurity. One commits abomination with his uh, neighbor's wife. Another lewdly defiles his daughter-in-law. And another in you violates his sister and his father's daughter. In you, they take bribes to shed blood. You take ursery and increase. You have made profit from your neighbor by exhorting exhortation and have forgotten me, says the Lord. What, what, what they were doing at that particular point, does that sound familiar? It sounds about right. You know, this is Old Testament, so uh, what, this is 3,000 years ago? It sounds like today. Sounds like what, exactly what we're doing. We're, 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 we're doing everything on that list. And, and what's his end comment? You've forgotten me. You've forgotten why you're, why, why you're down here. It's all about you, isn't it? No, it's not. It's not. Um, those of us here that, uh, in, in Western society, we're living in this. Um, we, we see the dangers of forgetting uh, God in everything we do. We look at our schools and we've removed God from the schools and look at where they are. We remove God from uh, the, the police and from the, the various... Uh, governmental entities and boom look where they are so uh, we're seeing it right now uh, it's it's not something that was 3,000 years ago and uh, we're done with it now and as we look around in this world um, there are there's so much wrong that's that's out there but paradoxically though um, passages of judgment like this one actually show us how much God cares for us God cares passionately about injustice and suffering. In other words, he, he looks at, he, he listed all those things. He looks at each one of those things. And the purpose of listing them is to show you that I notice this. I understand that this is going on. So don't think that it's, that I'm letting it slide. So from that standpoint, he is uh, and knows about um, what's uh, our suffering. So what I want to, to, you to glean out of this is to focus on your faith and hope and then be bold. Okay, so let's give you an example. Anybody uh, know who um, uh, General William Booth is? Salvation Army. He's the founder of the Salvation Army He's, and his, he modeled remarkable stickability, as I, as I call it. He said, while women weep, as they do now, I'll fight. While little children go hungry, as they do now, I'll fight. While men go to prison, in and out, in and out, I'll fight. While there is a, a poor lost girl upon the street, I'll fight. While there remains one dark soul without the light of God, I'll fight. I'll fight to the very end. There's a man who built a, a, a complete nonprofit organization around making sure that the things that God values are not left un, unrecognized. So that's what we get across. We want to focus on our faith. We want to focus on hope. And then we want to be bold. Okay? Um. So now let's listen, uh, in that same light, let's listen to uh, Paul's description. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. This is Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. To him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Um, why is this hope in, is so important? 
Um, it's because it's the building block. Why is hope important? It's the building block of our faith. Okay, so let's read uh, what God says about that. Hebrews, uh, yep, you guessed it, we're going there. Hebrews 11.1, uh, 1. now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. You all know that, you've probably hidden that one in your heart. Um, going on in he Hebrews 11.3, by faith we understand that works were framed by the word of God. Let me reread that. By faith we understand that the world's were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things that are visible. Did you understand that? The world was made and framed by the word of God, but nobody saw it coming. And that's faith. There's nothing here that, um, and we have this argument all the time as far as evolution versus creation, etc. There's nothing here that is going to build that faith other than the hope that Christ is working in your heart. There's not anything visible, and if you're all sitting around waiting for the scientific evidence, uh, it's it's there, but. Uh, it's there only supporting uh, certain constructs of um, uh, those arguments. So uh, that's what he's trying to get at. So what are we doing? Let's return to our troubles and embrace the moment. Stay focused. You know, when you're having those troubles, stay focused. Focused up here. Focused. Not down here. Um, and you say, okay, what's the, what's the next? Why, why am I going through these tribulations? Why am I directionally challenged? Uh, why am I uh, having to live through this? How many times do you, are you asked that? Well, let's read another verse. Um, Romans 5, 3 through 5. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hope, in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So see the, the, see the, the little um, algorithm there? We have tribulations and tribulations gives us perseverance in other words it gives us stick to itiveness and then perseverance gives us character and then character provides us with uh, the hope and then of course hope we just learned is the the root of our faith so let's draw a correlation uh, anybody um, ever mess with um, glow sticks yeah everybody does does the glow stick glow when you're holding it up? No. What do you have to do? Are you a glow stick? You, God breaks you so that your light will show up. He breaks you down because he builds character, perseverance, etc. And until he breaks that glow stick... You won't, you won't have. And again, I'm a prime example of that. I felt like I was a good person throughout my life until I was 26 years old. And then all of a sudden, God said, you are nothing. You're a sinner like the rest of us. No, not like him, but like the rest of the, my creation. So, All right, so let's look at one more thing. Uh, another good story. Anybody know who uh, Louis Braille is? Name sound familiar? Braille. Okay, let's give you a little history on Louis Braille. He's a nine-year-old. His dad made harnesses, so he worked with leather. At age nine, he had an awl that pierced one of his eyes. How that happened, I have no idea. Let's say his dad's working, um, and for some reason, they all pops out of his hand and ends up impaling him in the eye. He loses an eye. Okay? You think, mm, not a big deal, he's got another eye, um, okay, bad things happen, let's move on, etc. Two years later, he loses his other eye. 
bummer. I mean, really bummer. R what, what ends up happening in his life? He doesn't, uh, he continues to, he, forward, and his brother hands him a pine cone one day. And of course, he's struggling with trying to figure out how do I exist in this world where vision is very important. And uh, I can't see anything. I can't read books. I can't grow. He's only, you know, he's only 11 years old, uh, probably a little older when his brother hands him this pine cone. And what, is, what does he do with the pine cone? He starts feeling these little nubs on it. And he plays with this pine cone for a while. And the next thing that happens is he ends up going, hey, we can use that same thing. And they, he develops the, the, the technology of Braille. The, the little nubs that allow a blind person, and he revolutionizes um, the um, blind uh, individual industry. Or did he sit in the back and say, woe is me? No. He used it, God used him, and he came up with something that was helpful to all, all of population. So God is good, right? Um, now a little bit of encouragement now that, that we've got, we've still got, we've still got hope. Uh, Psalms 23, 4. Yep, you know this one. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So you, your hope is always strong. It's, a, it's always got that promise in the backing. Job 2. 9 and 10. And this Job is always great to look at because that man went through all sorts of stuff. And then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speak, or of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and shall we not accept Adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Just models, just uh, ideas on, on how to manage your life uh, when you think that all is wrong and you're, everything is falling apart. Hey, go ahead and, and um, think of Job. Lost everything, lost his whole family, um, went through an incredible number of uh, bad things, and then uh, God lifted him back up and gave him incredible riches. Hope in Christ allows us to handle anything. However, our, con our countenance is weak. Come, al uh, come alongside and support each other. Focus. Focus. For you have been called to be his light. Focus. Focus on God and be hopeful, faithful, and bold. Hope. You're not on your own. Let's pray.